In the northwest reaches of Wyoming sits Yellowstone National Park. Over two million acres of protected land where the wonders of the wild are preserved within its fierce tranquility. But within its volcanic forests, what secrets lurk? Where whispers of the missing are mingled with steam from deadly thermal springs of deceiving beauty. And horrifying encounters with unknown creatures echo with the roar of the grizzly. And where buffalo are stalked and slaughtered by strange crafts in the sky. Join us on this episode of Belief Hole as we traverse this strange, enchanting terrain and uncover the hidden world of Yellowstone National Park. Conspiracy, synchronicity, Sasquatch, homunculus, alien races, Satanism in Hollywood, MK Ultra, Tartaria. There's like a whole. I've been watching this one guy. Like, Close the door, in. Jury. In. Close your door. What's the uh, inner Earth disagreements? Ghost Dad. <laughs> I like that movie. Dogman, Bohemian Grove, Corey Feldman, Feldman. Magicians are demons. Specters, and spirits, spirits summonings, Each strange disappearance, Sky Whale phenomena, yes. alternative history, Shadow People. Shh, quiet. I'm trying to say words with the mouth. It's getting dicey out there. Poltergeists. That's cool. Anunnaki. What is the moon? <laughs> Elf towers. I would never talk about. It. That's old. Why to care? Cover ups. Apocalyptic catastrophe. Vampire. Vampire. Well, hello, hello. Hi. Welcome to be here. Welcome to Beliefful. I'm Jeremy. I'm John. And I'm Chris. And boy, do we have a show for you today. A real treat. A real treat and a treasure. A treat in the wilderness. A treasure of the American West. Yellowstone. This is the perfect time, I think, to go out west and have an adventure, especially here in Ohio where the weather will just not stop. I know we can't talk about the weather every time. No, we can, <laughs> but people are probably like, does the weather ever get nice there? Because we're always just like, the weather sucks. Weather does get nice at about midsummer. Yeah. Or randomly in February. Here in Ohio, we are weathering the weather. But today we're traveling further west. Oh, yeah. And back in time. Oh, cool. I mean, just to set this up a little bit. Not like in a time machine. Now, that would be neat, although probably scarier, I think, to be in Yellowstone in, say, 1800, when it was on the cusp of discovery. Uh, you think? So, Jer, why, why Yellowstone? What sort of belief worthy things are we going to be discussing? Well, it turns out that Yellowstone is a hotbed of mysterious phenomena. You know, we've all heard of all the strange disappearances in national parks. We've talked about this before. Our good friend Steve Stockton is an author and expert on this matter. We're going to be talking to him soon, actually, on the show, which is going to be really exciting. Yeah. So stick around for that in coming episodes, but there's just this strange nature, if you will, to national parks. And Yellowstone is a specific example of a place that is magic, in a sense. Some of the things, just to give you an idea of what's coming up in this episode, we're going to touch on the strange disappearance phenomena. We have real park ranger reports. Real. Verifiable. Yes, of horror stories of strange creatures. Those are hard to find. You must have really dug deep. I dug a long time. It wasn't towards the end. Because you guys probably seen out there, a very popular topic out there on the YouTubes is uh, park ranger horror stories. And unfortunately, most of them are either from a Reddit or No Sleep, which a lot of people don't know or may know is it can be fictional or not fictional. But if it is fictional, you're supposed to write it as if it's real. So it can be hard to verify. I can't believe there aren't more, though. I just feel like National Parks is such a weird, expansive place. (laughs) Yes. It should be more. Exactly, John. And this kind of goes to my theory. If you guys remember, we did an episode called Containment Theory, mm-hmm. and where I posited the idea that national parks were instituted to contain a kind of unidentified phenomena that could be dangerous to the public, whether that be, you know, big for big forts, <laughs> <laughs> big forts, Bigfoot, doorways to alternate dimensions, uh, access to the inner earth, all kinds of things. I think we mentioned dragon eggs, which of course, dragon eggs. Yeah, that was, I think we just said that in passing. seems like the most likely. (laughs) But the idea basically that, yeah, to contain a phenomena that's there, that was the idea. Occurred to me when I was searching, I was like, there has to be like not a single Bigfoot story in Yellowstone. And even I I found an article 
that linked to the National Park Service website, where officially they said that there have been no reports of Bigfoot. Suspiciously, that webpage is down. (laughs) My theory, speculative only, and of course fringe, very, maybe the reason we can't find reports is maybe because they're hushed up. You would think in a place as expansive as Yellowstone and as visited, it's what, like two million some acres? Of course, people can't go throughout the entire park, but it's just such a large area. There's millions of people that go there every year. And yet, where are all the reports? Of course, it's out there conspiracy to say that they're all being hushed up. But I did find some examples that I had never heard about. There's plenty of park ranger stories you can find that are like kind of a creepypasta or from a, a no sleep Reddit. But I found one. I found a couple, actually. We're going to be getting to that in this episode. Found a couple of verifiable ones, right? Oh, yeah. Like from legendary park rangers or a game and wildlife scientists that have worked in. One is specifically not in Yellowstone, but the other one is. So that's going to be really interesting coming up. And it may uh, clue us into a potential disturbing phenomena in the park. Cool. Oh, and of course, (laughs) besides Yellowstone's hidden Bigfoot problem, we'll be discussing a very interesting account of a buffalo abduction. Oh, yeah. Hmm. This is a pretty fantastic story. We covered her work before, Artie Sixkiller Clark. Do you remember this? We did that really good episode on star people, American Indians Mm -hmm. and aliens. Encounters with Star People, Untold Stories of American Indians by Artie Sixkiller Clark. Yeah. So uh, there's a- That sounds very familiar. Yeah. It was a really fun episode. I think we did in the expansion. So sign up if you want to hear a bunch of really cool stories. But uh, she went around and collected firsthand accounts from Native Americans on different reservations around the country. She knew a lot of them, apparently. And this person she knew the brother of, and then she managed to get him to tell a story. But had to keep it anonymous because he didn't want to, he was worried about getting ridiculed and losing his job. And he's got two daughters and all this and that. But the story that he tells is pretty incredible. So we're going to do that at the end of the yeah. episode. And again, that's a buffalo being abducted by a UFO. That's crazy. Yeah. So I would love that picture in my mind mm-hmm. that it paints. What kind of sound does a buffalo make? <laughs> this is probably <laughs> Friday. <laughs> fa- I wish I, this was video. <laughs> and perfect face for that. What kind of sound does it make when it's being abducted? That's what I meant. Oh, okay. Not just generally. Well, that was the, where I was going. Oh, with okay. It, as it's being Do sucked up. Do one more up. time with the UFO sound effect behind it. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be fun. <laughs> Weird. <laughs> so some stuff we'll be getting to that may end up actually probably in the expansion are going to be really interesting. Because of course, when you have people going missing, there are a lot of ways you could explain that naturally. And there are a lot of disturbing ways to die in the park, in Yellowstone, hot springs, geysers, it's, it's a freaky place, if you really think about it. Just as a cautionary tale, we might briefly touch on some of that in the expansion. But also, if you're missing the spooky side of Yellowstone, we're going to get into some ghost tales. Oh, yeah. The expansion's going to be great. Yellowstone so, vampires. Yes, Yellowstone vampires. I have a story of a Yellowstone vampire. Technically, it's right outside of the park, but I'm going to include it's it. It's close enough. Yeah. If they're outside, you know they're inside, too. Where um, there's smoke, there's fire. Yes. So let's get into it. Let's get into the strangeness of Yellowstone. And I want to start by setting the scene. Now we get to go back in time. Imagine early 1800s. Imagine you're an explorer, mountain man, going out west deep in the wilderness of the American West. Of course, you've never heard of Yellowstone or geysers or thermal pools. One day you're traveling alone, traveling for miles in the wilderness alone, and you find yourself on the doorstep of this seemingly indescribable alien land. Another world it seems like. The smell of rotten eggs, sulfur in the air. Land is teeming with abundant game. A place where the most apex predators watch from the tall pines. The ground is soft but warm beneath your aching feet, where water spews from the ground with such force and heat that the earth shakes beneath you. And all around you are jets of steaming water and pools of colorful splendor. Ooh, that sounds like another planet. It does. Now the question is, you're the first one there, or at least the first one from your community, from, let's say, old America. You went back to tell people. Would anyone believe you? No one believed Coulter, right? John Coulter was the first European-American to set eyes on the Teton Range and the Yellowstone region in 1803. And that was his problem. He told, you know, his descriptions and tales of fire and brimstone, but no one, no one believed him. And it's funny because even today there's a part of the Shoshone River that's called Coulter's Hell, named after the uh, mostly extinct thermal features there. 
that they called it Coulter's Held because it was this kind of outlandish place that couldn't possibly exist. Well, also because it sounded like they used to call it like the place where hell bubbles up. That was a different. That was, was a different guy. There, yeah, there was a man by the name of Jim Bridger who was a well-known trapper and scout and explorer, and he described it as a place where hell bubbled up. And he ran into the same problem in 1856. He tried to get his report published in the Kansas City newspaper, and the editor rejected it as outright lies because it just sounded so that's funny. crazy. A place where water shoots out of the ground and yeah, it's weird that not believe it was possible. Yeah, nowadays it just seems. Have like, you guys been there? Yeah, yeah. We were young. I mean eighth grade or something. Yeah, it's a pretty wild place. I wish I would have spent more time there. Me too. I was too young to really appreciate it. I was on my way to Seattle. So I was like really anxious yeah. to get out there, but it's an interesting place. And I know we only saw like a tiny portion of it. Terrifying too. I, in the expansion, we'll talk more about this, but there are a lot of people that have died because it's so beautiful. It kind of entrances you and you don't realize how dangerous it is to, even if you step off the path in certain places, you can just plunge into boiling water. And a lot of people have. Yeah. Oh, really? There's, there's not gar- There's not like rails up in well, a lot of these places. It's very minimal because they wanted to balance this feeling of fun and adventure and the natural landscape of it. So it's very minimal. They have like signs posted like, hey, don't step off the trap. But people have slipped off the boardwalk, which is kind of raised above, I believe. The ground, the problem is the ground is so thin there in places that you can step off and break through this thin crust into, you know, two feet of boiling water. Yeah, it's a thin, they thin crust. They die that way? Some of them get out, but by the time they get anywhere, they they die from the third degree burns. <sighs> yeah, most of the strange deaths come from jumping in a hot spring, not realizing it's one you shouldn't be jumping mm-hmm. into. I There's, feel like I've seen that in a movie. Dante's a Peak, times. I think that was the opening <laughs> yes. scene, wasn't it? They're like enjoying a nice bubbly lovers around right. and they're yeah. just, ooh, it's getting hot. It's a little too hot. <laughs> Sad. Yeah, when it happens in real life, obviously, it's, it's, but yeah, we'll talk about some of the expansion. But I'm just saying, I think there. a lot of people realized like that, you know, there was a vol- super volcano there at Yellowstone, but I, I don't know how many people, I don't know how obvious it is to a lot of people that so much of it, you're basically walking on the caldera of a, of a dormant volcano, somewhat dormant yeah. volcano. It's everywhere underneath you and you don't it's realize terrifying. it. So I thought it'd be interesting to get a first hand account of one of the first discoveries of this magic, majestic, and beautiful place. Of course, there were tribes that had been there for centuries, millennia, the Blackfeet, the Shoshone, the Nez Perce, maybe the Crow and others. But ancient people going back at least 11,000 years have existed and utilized Yellowstone for one reason or another. But of course, the first written records were from the European Americans, the trappers and uh, mountain men. But among the first written reports that inspired readers and led to eventually the establishing of the park were the expeditions, like the Folsom Cook Expedition of 1869. And one of those men, David Folsom, penned down his impression of the Yellowstone area that would eventually become the future park. And these words told the wonders of Yellowstone, first heard by the settled West and settled America at large. And this is a quote. This comes from the place where hell bubbled up. The History of the First National Park by David A. Clary. To David Folsom, the voices of the animals were but the voice of nature, reminding men of their smallness in the natural world and of their aloneness in a strange country. Quote, The wolf sends us afar, and the mournful cadence of his howl adds to our sense of solitude. The roar of the mountain lion awakens the sleeping echoes of the adjacent cliffs, and we hear the elk whistling in every direction. And then Folsom goes on to recall his last look at Yellowstone Lake this way. Nestled among the forest-crowned hills which abound our vision lay this inland sea, its crystal waves dancing and sparkling in the sunlight, as if laughing with joy for their wild freedom. It is a sense of transcendent beauty which has been viewed by few white men, and we felt glad to have looked upon it before its primeval solitude should be broken by the crowds of pleasure seekers, which at no distant day will throng its shores. Oh my, isn't that true? Right? Is this like the whole plot of the Yellowstone TV show, right? Pleasure seekers coming in and kind of city slickers ruining it for the the locals. Yeah, well, that's I mean that's what went on to happen. I mean, not necessarily ruining it, but. That's very prophetic. No distant day will throng its shores, these pleasure seekers. And I think... They're just like, woo, it's so <laughs> fun to be at Yellowstone. They called it. It's funny because the, the actual... When we talked about this in the containment theory episode, guys, go check that out. Yellowstone National Park being the first national park recognized, of course, to keep in this paranormal phenomena that's definitely taking people. Definitely. Uh, prove that in that episode. 
Wink, wink. Beyond um, the shadow of a doubt. But check that out. But um, the act that was put in place, I must have been right around this time, maybe shortly after, but they actually called it, quote, a public park or pleasuring ground for the benefit and enjoyment <laughs> of the people. It's a good name. But it is an, just an incredible place. So I can't imagine what that was like. And now, obviously, how different at least some areas of it would be. But of course, there's areas within the park that are still untouched. And I believe there are areas that the people have never explored still in the park. I mean, it's 2 million acres. What could lie there? Mm-hmm. In the dark of the park. Definitely not a place you'd like to get lost. Right. No. And of course, this is a great description of the majestic, fantastic, and mysterious setting where our stories take place. And speaking of lost and going missing, I have an interesting account. I found the very first account of someone going missing in Yellowstone National Park. So this is a bit of a period piece, if you will. And we'll do eventually more episodes on specifically. The missing, because that really deserves its own episode. Mm-hmm. We've done, we've touched on missing four and one before and that kind of idea, like within containment theory. But I did want to mention this one because I'd never heard this account before. And it is the very first disappearance in the park. And one thing to note, some of the strange little factoids that you guys have probably heard if you've looked into the subject at all that we visited in the past episodes. Like one, John, you'll remember, there's no real record kept of people going missing in national parks specifically, which is just so odd. Mm-hmm. So strange. In the early 2000s, they attempted this, creating a database. It was called, I believe, IMARS, the Incident Management Analytics Reporting System. However, only 14% of cases, only 14% actually get entered into the system. That's so weird. Like, is it that hard? I mean, I'm sure there's a lot of things that go into it. If but only they had something like computers and the internet. <laughs> like, could you just have like a system set up where you have a, maybe three people at each park are responsible for reporting incidents and they go to even a web, even a data website, mm-hmm. maybe not even a software that has to interconnect with everything. Think about MUFON, right? you know, something that relatively simple. Well, MUFON is largely its volunteer, right? I don't know mm-hmm. if people get paid in that or not. The problem, of course, as according to this article that I'll link in the show notes, park rangers and employees have pointed out is that the system is flawed It's not easy to use, so they don't. And these employees will cite things like lack of funds and manpower to enter and update the information. Just make it easy to use. It just doesn't seem that hard, you know? Where does the government funding come from? The taxpayer? It just seems like there's just so much wasted money in the world from the government. What are you talking about? (laughs) A little off topic, but did you hear we spent, what was it, uh, like $150,000 or something on a study to see if a metal hand could snap its fingers? like Thanos in the Avengers to see if it was possible. Because in that movie, he snaps his fingers. If it would make a sound. It would make a snapping sound. Yeah. We spent like $100,000. If you're familiar with Rand Paul, the senator, he did a- It's got to be like some just giving money to someone, like funneling money for something. There's so much lack of- That's the thing with- I mean, this is a whole other topic, the, obviously, the, but- yeah, I mean, not yeah, knowing we won't go into this, but yeah, the Pentagon, yeah. like they couldn't account for like trillions of dollars or oh, something. Yeah. Oh, right before 9-11. No, the, well, this was recently. Oh, really? There was like, I don't know it wasn't trillions, but it was like hundreds of billions of dollars. Like they just have no idea where it went. The accounting is crazy. You think that you give so much money away or you spend it and it's taxpayers' money, it's the people's money that they earn- there should be some receipt. There should be this. There should be an account at least knowing where the funds are going. Yeah. John Stewart just interviewed this head of something of the pen. And she was like really upset that he was like questioning her on it. Yeah. She was like so entitled. You could tell that you shouldn't even be allowed to ask these questions. Mm-hmm. And he was just like laying into her, just being like, this is just basic accounting. I mean, I don't understand how you could not think that this is an issue. Yeah. Right. Link that clip. But this is one of the arguments that people have made in the ufology community for years about black budget projects. And we had a whole episode on uh, breakaway civilization. Mm-hmm. You know, like you get deep enough in black military projects. Where, right. I mean, how much money just drops in there that we know just goes into these places and there's no accounting for what's going on with it and who's using it to what benefit. Exactly. I mean, the, the whole point of this conversation was just, there's all this money being wasted and not accounted for and we can't get money for things that would be relatively inexpensive yeah, and like easy a system to implement. And helpful working, to people. Like a working system. Yeah, like a real, yeah, to the families that mm-hmm. have lost people and, you know, potentially being able to understand more about what's going on in these parts. Yeah. But then there lies the deeper question. Right. Is, this, is it being intentionally not allowed to really be tracked and traced? Yeah, if you want to go deep down the rabbit hole of old school belief hole, the conspiracy side, I'm talking about just some sort of harvest. You know, right. I mean, it's definitely, that's way out there. Some people are like, come on. Hey, but, that was containment theory. Was that idea? Mm-hmm. I mean, think about how many, there's hundreds of thousands of missing children every yeah. year. People in general. But just children. Mm-hmm. I mean, we don't talk about this too much anymore, but 
you know, the trafficking and adrenochrome and yeah. where it seems like that's a possibility. We know that there's people in high places that we're getting a little off topic here. <laughs> there's a group like a child trafficking ring busted in France or something. 75 politicians implicated, 40 journalists and like actors and musicians. Yeah, there's a huge one in Belgium a few years ago. There was a, a big, I think it was Belgium, a big story, but you don't hear a lot about it over here. They no. don't report on it very often. But then you, when you bring this sort of stuff up, you know, you're a nut, you're a conspiracy theorist. Even but though these, things, things like things Jeffrey happen. Epstein happened, right. and it's crazy. But anyways, we're, that's not what we're going into. But that stuff is a possibility when it comes to like the park stuff too. Yeah, there could yeah. be some sort of, maybe even off world harvesting. Yeah, who knows, man? I mean, it's a perfect escape hatch, if you will, a place to hide well, things if, away. If you hear the, we'll hear the account at the end of the story where there was a harvesting, off world harvesting, at least of buffalo. Oh, at the end of the episode. Yeah. So stick around for that. Uh, and he's missed. <laughs> he's well, they missed. return him. Oh, they do? Why, well, why are you spoiling the story? Oh, well, what are you, it. dad? <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, potential of people going missing for, I mean, a number of reasons. And of course, there are the natural, like we talked about, the natural phenomena that's disturbing in its own right. Well, there's a lot that can happen to you in Yellowstone. It's yeah. natural. Exactly. Still never be seen again, for sure. Right. Eaten by a bear, apex predator, just, you know, stolen away. Just getting lost and starving to death. Or mm -hmm. falling into a geyser. I mean, there's so many things falling into a hot spring. Anyways, I thought the first account would be interesting to tell because I'd never heard before. So this is a bit of a period piece. The setting of this scene is one of the large hotels that once existed at Yellowstone. There are hotels that have come and gone, large structures over the, the needs of the park changing over time. The setting of this story is the Fountain Hotel. This hotel opened in 1891, three stories tall and could accommodate 350 guests. And this was a fancy kind of hotel given its rustic surroundings. And guests would often wear their finest clothes to regular evening balls. Sounds fun. So imagine that you got springs and geysers around you and buffalo roaming outside. Bears at the door at times it was this raw in the park and you're in your finest outfit and maybe you want to go out for a smoke and what might happen to you and this is that story and this comes from annie carlson who is a research coordinator at the yellowstone center for resources writing for the yellowstone caldera chronicles the fountain hotel was in operation during the stagecoach years of park history before modern roads and cars visitors toured the park along dusty dirt roads in horse-drawn stagecoaches. It was a full day's ride from the former National Hotel in Mammoth Hot Springs to the Fountain Hotel. Guests of the Fountain Hotel had access to bubbling mud pots, active geysers, scenic meadows, and mountain views. Another popular attraction was a bear feeding station just behind the hotel. Kitchen staff would throw food and garbage out for the hungry bears to the delight of guests who watched nearby. The Fountain Hotel was the setting of a notorious unsolved mystery. On the night of July 30th, 1900, a 36-year-old Ohio man named Leroy R. Piper was a guest at the hotel. According to the historian Aubrey Haynes, on that night, Mr. Piper ate his dinner, bought a cigar at the stand in the lobby, and stepped out into the night, where he vanished utterly. Although a thousand dollar reward was offered and detachments of Calvary searched for weeks, Mr. Piper was never found. That's sad. There lies the first disappearance in the park. Interesting. I mean, it could have been anything there, but probably UFO abduction. Probably an inner earth creature coming out and snatching. There's so many stories like that. There's one that I want to do one day. Someone wrote in about this recently. I think it might have been Jill Cooper, but it's someone with our namesake, Parfit. Uh, an Owen. early distant. Do you ever hear about that? Owen Parfit, one of the first like unexplained recorded disappearances. I forget where it took place, but he basically, we'll cover this sometime because it's an interesting story. It's one of the missing four. It's like one old cases. feeble guy, basically, with our name, our last name. And he's left on the porch for a minute. And then someone comes back out to the porch and then he's just gone. But he was like, you know, pretty feeble. Couldn't really get around by himself, but he would just, just gone off his porch. Owen Parfit. So we'll, we'll touch on that sometime. But yeah, this happens a lot where people just, they're there one minute, not the next tragic and mysterious. I hope you enjoy that cigar. L.R. Piper. Yeah, who knows? There's all kinds of stories, but I did find the actual obituary for L.R. Piper coming out of Ohio. Uh, the headline was L.R. Piper still missing. Relatives of Ohio banker have given him up as dead. Oh, banker. Maybe he was murdered. That was one theory. Chris, would you read this? I think this just kind of paints an interesting picture, especially towards the end of this quote here. Just sets up that mysterious tone of what it must have been like and all the possibilities of what could have happened. 
The family of Leroy R. Piper, cashier of the First National Bank and a wealthy young businessman of St. Mary's, who mysteriously disappeared July 30th last at Yellowstone Park while on a business and pleasure trip to the Pacific Coast, has given up all hope of his return. At the time Mr. Piper disappeared, the best detectives were employed, and a systematic search of the park was made without finding any trace of the young man. Several theories were advanced. One, that his mind became unbalanced and he wandered away. Another, that he was murdered for what money he had with him. And a third, that he accidentally fell into one of the pools or geysers of that strange place. And a strange place it is, indeed. And of course, if it was more of a, one of those tragic natural deaths, that'll be explored more in the expansion. Some creepy stories there. But this does harken back to the idea, people going missing. And the concept, I know the crazy kind of fringe theory about containment theory that we touched on before. I don't know if you guys remember that I mentioned that the first people who kind of managed the park were the cavalry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was interesting. Before they got a National Park Service. Wasn't there like a huge fort there? So I didn't know this, but Yellowstone, there's a Fort Yellowstone, or at least there was. It was an operation, I think, until like the mid-1930s or something to that effect. The U.S. Army relinquished control of the Fort Yellowstone facility in 1918 when the National Park Service took over. But it was like a little army. They had 324 soldiers in the middle of nowhere. And I mean, it's Yellowstone National Park, but it's not like you're defending from outside forces. Of course, the idea is that they're there to defend from the poachers and vandals at the time. It just seems like such a large force. Yeah. I'm not saying that that's, you know, not the actual reality, but it does make you speculate. What if? What could be out there? And especially with the many missing people and the strange phenomena. And of course, the creature sightings. Yeah. Was there something being contained? What if in the park is another predator, an apex predator, beyond bears and wolves, a hidden predator kept secret, an intelligent bipedal, unrecognized predator in the park. Are there any credible accounts of such a creature? There is. All right, good. And it is here. Are you ready? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> this is one of the stories I found from an actual Yellowstone Park Ranger. This guy's a legend. He's a 30-year ranger veteran, really well-known. We'll have a link to the original article. It'd be cool to get him on an interview. Yeah. Bob Jackson is his name. But is what he saw a hint of what might be hiding, lurking in the park, maybe kept secret from the public? Maybe the reason the parks were initiated in the first place. Crazy? Sure. Real? Definitely. Probably. <laughs> <laughs> this comes from Cowboys and Indians magazine, written by Noah Bailey, October 9th, 2018. And it's titled, A Legendary Yellowstone Ranger Recounts His Strangest Wildlife Encounters in, quote, the home of Bigfoot. Home of Bigfoot, mighty claim. Mighty indeed. Let's see what he saw. No one knows Yellowstone like Bob Jackson. Over the course of 30 years as a backcountry ranger, he logged more miles on a horse and captured more poachers than anyone in the park's history mostly in the region known as Thoroughfare, the farthest point from a road in the lower 48. From his bison ranch in Iowa, he can still recall the park's most obscure drainages with nearly photographic accuracy, the way subalpine fir thickets dotted a meadow, how an old burlap sack still hung in the doorframe of a dilapidated trapper cabin, the stacks of rock two feet high where Native Americans chipped arrowheads, the way a stream dropped off into a dark limestone abyss just off US 191. And most curiously, the way a certain sound reverberated along Fan Creek in the Gallatin Mountains on a clear afternoon in 1978. We were just talking on our horses, quiet day, and all at once we heard this thing that just kept going on and on and on, like a thousand elk going to their death. Two weeks later, on a solo patrol from the nearby Sportsman Lake cabin, his horse smelled something that alarmed it. He started flaring his nose, which they do with grizzly bears. They don't even do it with a black bear. Hmm. Scanning the meadow below him, he only saw one small deer, hardly anything to be alarmed about. 
Suddenly, the deer bolted, and another animal flushed out of a fur thicket. Quote, I thought, oh, there's a bear. Then I said, whoa, this thing's running on two legs. The creature zigzagged across a subalpine meadow, running with its arms swinging low, plainly visible between clumps of fir trees moving from thicket to thicket until it was out of sight. He didn't go straight away like a grizzly or any animal that's trying to get away from you. This thing was smart, he says, describing it as six to seven feet high and covered in long black hair. And that was the last Jackson saw of it. Though he did hear the blood chilling sound once more in the 1980s, in the Upper Mountain Creek area, in the Absaroka Mountains, the range that forms the eastern boundary of Yellowstone. I timed it and it was 26 seconds long. I'm sure you could have heard it two, three miles down the mountain creek. It was that loud. The next morning, Jackson went looking for tracks, but came up empty-handed. As to why there's never been a body found, he only has this to add. In 30 years of being in the backcountry, I only found two bear carcasses, and there's hundreds of grizzly and the same amount of black bear. Jackson also points out how his last encounter was only five or six miles from the location of another strange incident in Yellowstone lore, where a crew fighting white pine blister rust found a freshly deboned elk carcass surrounded by giant footprints. You always heard the Absaroka, the Indian said, was the home of the Bigfoot, he says. Somewhere far off trail, miles and miles into the backcountry, past the concessions and the geysers and the tourists, maybe it still is. Interesting. With its family of other Bigfoot. <laughs> <laughs> I doubt they said Bigfoot. Well, I guess they might have been referring to the, the more modern term. Yeah. But that wasn't obviously wasn't a Native American. Yeah, probably. Sasquatch or. Right. But their term for, or, you know, some might use that word now. That's tr- yeah, very true. Instead yeah. of the, whatever the translation of the hairy man. And we'll get into some of that Native connection later on after the break. I thought that was an interesting point about, we talk about that a lot when we have covered Bigfoot in the past mm-hmm. or any cryptid really where you don't find the bodies. Yeah. Yeah. In such massive wilderness, he's only come across two grizzly bear skeletons or bodies in his entire 30 year career roaming those wild acres of land. There are hundreds in the park. And then imagine a much smaller population potentially of a Bigfoot Sasquatch type Mm -hmm. creature. Or interdimensional. Or interdimensional. Yeah. What if it is interdimensional? The more, one of the more out there theories, but possible it escapes through a portal. You're not going to find the body. Uh, It, it dies, maybe is buried or the body is moved because they're an intelligent species. I mean, that seems, yeah, regardless of if it's interdimensional, like these things are definitely smart. And if they want to be hidden, Right. They're yeah. not going to just leave, leave a, someone a to... Yeah, exactly. Even if you go the more biological route, people have argued that this is some offshoot... Like a Gigantopithecus? Or some offshoot missing link sort of creature. But it's developed more with nature. It's more in tune with everything. It's going to be way better at disguising its tracks, moving through the woods where you're not going to... Virtually invisible to like a modern Homo sapien that's right. not, nowhere near that connected to nature. Yeah. And at home. I don't think that's what the Bigfoot is, those accounts. But but regardless, I think those are good arguments that that ranger makes about Mm -hmm. not finding a carcass. And the deboned elk, that's weird. That was a disturbing, (laughs) a freshly deboned elk with giant footprints around it. Mm -hmm. So like he pulled the bones out and maybe for tools, some sort. And then just what, left the floppy carcass maybe there for for his uh, woodland friends. Does that connect more to the UFO sightings that have occurred? Oh, the cattle mutilations. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We had some recent cattle mutilations actually. Mm -hmm. We need to talk about that at some point. But this is just one story. And who knows how many stories and sightings have happened that we just don't hear about. You know, this comes from a ranger who spends a lot of time in the park and has experienced some things. Coming up, we have an even freakier story after the break. Freakier tale of a, uh, I believe, a fish and game biologist in Wyoming who, while camping, experienced an attack of something horrifying. That's going to be coming up after the break, which extends more into this mystery of what might be there in the park. Also, after the break, we're going to have Yellowstone Zone of Death. That's an interesting little conversation, a weird little fluke on the map of Yellowstone Park. And the laws of America. Interesting. The laws of America. Yeah, it's a weird little place. We'll we'll get into that after the break. Oh, and of course, the Buffalo UFO abduction. Yes. Incredible tale. But before that, of course, we have to dive into the break. Chris, what do we have for the expansion? Uh, We're going to get into more bizarre experiences in Yellowstone, supernatural, vampiric even. Even strange deaths and the Yellowmageddon debate, the supervolcano, and what might happen. And some of, it, some of the expansion is going to be a little heavy. 
So fair warning, it's probably not a very kid-friendly episode. Also, yeah, we're going to talk about, you know, you always hear about if Yellowstone blows, it's going to be a nuclear winter. Because for, for those of you who don't know, it yeah. is atop a giant volcano. That would be a terrifying event for the world. And we'll, so we'll talk about how much of it's true, like how deadly would it be? We're going to get into those details and what it would look like, which states would be overwhelmed by pyroclastic flows, how far out the ash will go. Well, it's going to be fun, All that fun stuff. That's pretty dark. <laughs> it's dark, but it's, it's interesting. But, but to counter that, I have some quote myth busting anecdotes from the observatory, the volcano observatory there in Yellowstone. You know, whether they're just trying to hush it up because they don't want people to be afraid or it's actually calming irrational fears, that'll be in the expansion. Along with more creature encounters, spirits and high strangeness. And of course, the strange sounds heard all about Yellowstone. Oh yes, lake music and the mysterious hum. Whispers on the wind. Whispers on the wind. And we have a video from a TikToker actually who recorded a strange Is hum. that what the kids call them? TikToker? TikToker. TikToker. <laughs> that is what the kids call them. <laughs> Uh, cool. Yes. Yeah. The expansion is going to be great. So sign up and check that out. You get a menagerie of full, high quality episodes, just as produced, just as researched, and just as fun yeah. as the main episodes on the main feed. Bluefield.com, click on the big red button. And you support our continued creation. That's yes. right. All right. Check out this clip. We'll see you after the break. Access granted. Thank you. All right. Well, let's get started, guys. Let's get this episode erupting with what it would be like if the mega volcano under Yellowstone did in fact erupt. This is, I want, so I want you to picture this as I'm going to kind of outline this. This comes from science.howstuffworks. A lot of places you can find out or get some descriptions of what would occur, but I like how this was broken down. You can definitely picture it. So basically, if it were to erupt, you could expect it to kill as many as 90,000 people immediately. What? And spread a 10-foot layer of molten ash as far as 1,000 miles. Oh my gosh. From the park. So the ash would probably block off points of entry. You wouldn't be able to get a lot of rescue operations going. The spread of the ash and gases into the atmosphere would stop most air travel. Equally as frightening is the nuclear winter. You hear about this all the time, right? That idea. Oh, yeah. That some experts say could blanket the U.S. and other parts of the world if Yellowstone were to blow. Sulfuric gases released from the volcano would spring into the atmosphere and mix with the planet's water vapor. The haze of gas that could drape the country wouldn't just dim the sunlight. It would also cool temperatures. Falling temperatures would do a number on our food supply, decimating crops and throwing the food chain out of whack. Welcome back, listeners. Welcome back. Thank you for being a friend. What's that from? Travel down the road and back again. My heart is true. Still not figuring that out. What is that? Uh. Wait, that's not. I always want to think it's Welcome Back, Cotter, but now it's, it's not definitely right. a TV show. Thank you for being. I was like right before my time. Well, probably well. Before yeah, my it time. was. It was a little bit before, like the step by step. It was like TV Land era, late eighties or something. Night Court. No. <laughs> Night Someone Court. tell us. Leave it. Leave it in the comments. We got to have more things to ask people to leave comments about. What is the theme song? Please email us about this. Even if you hear this three months from now, four months. No email, comment. Yes, thank you for being a friend and continuing our journey, the adventure in Yellowstone. Yellowstone Park. Don't forget to like, subscribe, comment, leave a review. Call your congressman. Sign up for the expansion. So interestingly, John, have you heard of the zone of death? No. This is pretty crazy. So, the majority of Yellowstone sits in Wyoming, but it actually occupies portions of three different states. 3% stretches into Montana, and only 1%, but still a percent, overlaps into eastern Idaho. Now, what's crazy about this, John, if you're familiar at all with the Sixth Amendment of the Constitution, pop quiz, hot shot. Is that the right to own and bear uh, iguanas? Keep and own bears. <laughs> own bear arms <laughs> keep and bear. own bear arms <laughs> i thought it was the right to like i don't remember yes i'm a constitutionalist this is a jury of your peers i just talked to you about this chris don't you little cheat trying to sound smart essentially in all criminal prosecutions the accused shall enjoy the right to a speedy and public trial by an impartial jury of the state and district wherein the crime shall have been committed now here's this curious loophole 
that has given this 50 square mile region of Yellowstone the moniker, the zone of death. Because all of Yellowstone, all crimes potentially committed in Yellowstone was given oversight by Congress in 1872 to the federal court in the District of Wyoming. So the entire park is the District of Wyoming's jurisdiction. However, it overlaps into Idaho. So if you commit a crime in the 50 square miles of overlap between Wyoming and Idaho, where the jurisdiction of Wyoming extends in the park over top of Idaho, this 50 square mile area, and you are guaranteed a trial by your peers or an impartial jury from both the state and the district, that requires, in order for them to collect a jury, they have to collect people specifically from that 50 square mile area. Nobody lives there. Nobody lives there. Therefore, it's a dead man zone. You could kill a man, theoretically, and get away with murder. That's the zone of death? That is the zone of death. Has it happened? The, the concept. Not that we know of. <laughs> now, here's the thing about the zone of death. I thought it was going to be like some place like the Bermuda Triangle. Well, and so here's the thing. Like there are theories that circulate online. This has been an idea that's been around for a while. Actually, a guy by the name of Brian Colt was a lawyer. I think a professor now. He wrote a paper about this and we'll have it linked in the show notes. This the idea has been around for a while. He pointed out this loophole and um, Boise Democratic representative Colin Nash heard about this when he was in law school before he became congressman and is now, or at least as of February 2022, was sponsoring a joint memorial to formally ask Congress to close the loophole because he had concerns. And he says, quote, no crimes have been committed that I'm aware of and gone unprosecuted. But every time there's a high profile disappearance in the area, I think about this. Hmm. And there were just two last year. And so you have theories circulating online. And with the concept of this zone of death, could this be a kind of beacon for those who might wish to do harm? Yeah. Whether or not you could actually get off the hook. Right, right. Which is it's unlikely. Up, up in the air. But a recent pop culture thing, John, I don't know if you ever saw the show Yellowstone. Overall, uh, pretty great show. There's some... I mean, I saw the, what you had up there It's a lot of horse love. A lot of horse love. Sometimes it gets over the top with the, you know, when they're, <laughs> they're dancing with the horse, doing the horse stops and turns. It's a little much. <laughs> but Kevin Costner's great in it. But there's a scene, and we'll drop that clip. It's very short, but he's basically describing this because in the plot, in the show Yellowstone, the Duttons, the family of the Duttons, they've used this area for several decades to get rid of bodies. To dispose of. But they call it, at least they think that's the creator of the show, uses this as inspiration because it is right outside a yellow, in part of Yellowstone Park or whatever, but he, they call it the train station. Like, oh, he, we took him to the train station. Yeah. Just, just means we dumped his body in this potential zone of death. Well, yeah. maybe we'll drop a short clip of that. Well, maybe you should take him to the train station. What do you want to know? What is it? Exactly. It's a trash can for everyone who's attacked us. It lays in a jurisdictional dead zone in a county with a population of exactly zero hints. No jury of your peers and no court for a change in venue. Why are you so surprised? Wouldn't that be funny if Kevin Costner hated the outdoors? <laughs> <laughs> just on a personal level? And he just well, always he, cast a, like being in these outdoor films. I think he has a ranch. Oh, or he hates the mail. And he was <laughs> in the postman. <laughs> He's like, I guess I'll do it. He hates the mail. I mean, he embodies that character yeah. so well. I'm sure he loves being out there. Yeah. Anyway, to your question, John, there was actually, in part of the 3% where the park overlaps into Montana, which is just north of where it overlaps in Idaho, I guess there was a poaching. They could potentially have drawn... Uh, juror of their peers because it's like sparsely populated. But the judge, it seemed like the judge essentially just didn't want to deal with this loophole and recognize the zone of death. So they like pleaded it out. Hmm. So he didn't get away with it, but it was the judge's discretion. They didn't even, I think, take that into account. Anyways, point is don't go to the zone of death and commit any crimes because you probably will still get caught. Just don't commit crime anyway, unless you're not paying your taxes or something. I don't advise that either. You'll still go to jail. Shut not- up. <laughs> Shut up, Donnie. But let's get back to the question of the big hairy guy, the Bigfoot, the hidden Bigfoot of Yellowstone. Is Bigfoot taking people? This is the question that's been with us for a millennia, even if we don't know it. Plenty of accounts. Sasquatch abduction in the West. Now, this also comes from Cowboy and Indians magazine. I might subscribe. They actually have a lot of really good, well-written articles and information I couldn't find anywhere else. So I'll link that in the show notes and recommend it. Now, they point out that in the Thule River, are these giant pictographs on the Indian reservation there. I've seen these before. In California's Sierra Nevada foothills. And this tells an ancient story, a creation tale of the Yokut people. And the gatekeeper 
of their spiritual world. Now, remember that gatekeeper, right? Mm-hmm. What did we talk about before? Interdimensionality. Portals in the park, potentially. The gatekeeper of the spiritual world. This figure to them was known as Hairy Man. The pictographs are dated from 3,000 to 1,800 years old. And this comes from Kathy Strain of Forest Heritage Resource and Tribal Relations Programs Manager for Stanislaus, Stanislaus National Forest and author of Giants, Cannibals, and Monsters, Bigfoot in Native Culture. She goes on to say the hairy man is actually eight feet tall. Now, these pictographs are pretty incredible. We'll have pictures in the show Those notes. Those are cool. And if you're on YouTube, I'm sure we'll pop them up on screen for you. John, would you read the quotes from her in this article? The Yokut believe when you see a Bigfoot, it's not a good sign. It means he's coming to take somebody who's going to pass over to the other side. There's even a hairy man song that women sing during a funeral to make sure he does take that soul over. The Yokut aren't alone either. You'll find stories of Bigfoot-like creatures in the oral tradition of dozens of North American tribes under a slew of names, Sasquatch and Skookum among them each ascribing slightly different qualities to the creature. For the Yurok and Karak of Northwest California, Bigfoot is just another denizen of the forest, worthy of cautious respect, just like a bear or a cougar. But for the Maywook of the Yosemite area, Bigfoot is a boogeyman, not unlike the witch from Hansel and Gretel, snatching children from their tribe and eating them. There's even a place in the Stanislaus National Forest, Pinnacle Point Cave, where the tribe believes the Bigfoot consumed its victims. This cave really did have human remains in it that were excavated back in the 1960s. And what's interesting is that you have to actually rappel down into this cave to see it. So how did a tribe that doesn't have any climbing equipment have a traditional story that the cave had bones in it? If that's not strange enough, The indigenous peoples of coastal British Columbia, nearly 1,000 miles to the north, share nearly identical legend of the cannibal Zanukwa, quote, the wild woman of the woods. Mm. Often depicted on totem poles, displaying a behavior that comes up time and time again in Bigfoot accounts, whistling. Interesting, so here you have this lore, and I will say, for those of you who are gonna start commenting, that this is referencing California uh, and Sierra Nevadas and not Yellowstone. That is true. I'm just painting the broader picture of Bigfoot in the West and the mm-hmm. idea of abduction and taking. Yeah, I was going to say this earlier too. Do you guys remember we did that? John, you remember that incredible video we covered on a live stream of the buffalo? In the background was the family of Big Feet that were coming through the yes. snow. Mm-hmm. It was a that was Yellowstone. Oh, remember that? Yeah. So, so you guys haven't seen that. Actually, that's I, another great account. I think for those of you on YouTube, by the way, if you guys aren't watching our videos on YouTube or subscribe, go check that out. Belief Hole podcast on YouTube. For those of you who are on YouTube, we'll probably drop that clip at the end of this episode just for a little extra treat. That was really compelling. That's, that's coming up. Actual evidence, visual evidence of Bigfoot in Yellowstone. And again, that was just to point out that many tribes, probably all of those, by the way, I'm sure we didn't pronounce correctly. Our apologies. It's hard to look all the pronunciations up for it's everything. It's hard to do it right all the time. But we do try really hard. Um, didn't have a chance to look those up. Regardless, we're only human. There is a pattern here. And this article is one piece of evidence that points that out. We've covered this in the past as well. Some would argue that maybe just some species of Bigfoot, if you don't want to throw hate at Bigfoot in general, do have this propensity to take people. Well, if you think they're like people, different tribes of different people, different cultures do, you know, different things. And, you know, whether you're Viking, raping and pillaging, Mm -hmm. you know, at a certain time and you're doing things. Certain times you do things. Certain times you do things. It's good. uh, Why is sage different uh, values, value systems, different morales, different, you know. Yeah, that's an interesting comparison. I mean, some Bigfoot (laughs) might think it not good to steal people. And some other Bigfoot (laughs) might be like, it's it's fine to steal people. Better to take care of your family with by stealing humans. Well, we do have a, I promised a freakier attack. Ooh. Now this again takes place in Montana. Is it Montana? Mm-hmm. Montana, it's Montana tent attack. Tent attack. <laughs> well, that's a weird word phrase. Montana tent attack. <laughs> I like it. So this next account I titled Montana tent attack, not a super exciting title, but it is an exciting tale. Gets to the point. Oh, and this does not take place specifically inside Yellowstone, I don't think, but it is in the state. And maybe if it was in Yellowstone, if it took place there, if it was reported there, maybe it would have been covered up. 
<laughs> well, a lot of speculation there. <laughs> yeah, I know. A lot of extrapolations. Going We're doing on. some speculation, guys, so don't don't hate. And maybe if it was in there, it would have <laughs> been covered up. up. Maybe a portal opened <laughs> and they jumped in. Um, I mean, if there is a, pop- a small population of Bigfoot in the park, like we saw in that video, which yeah. we'll have linked, Bigfoot's not going to follow the rules of the boundary of Yellowstone, unless there right. is a containment going on. Right. But he can wander out to wherever this took place. Well, yeah. I mean, we, portals are, sound crazy, but we do do Missing 411 Portal Theory, which mm-hmm. actually was a pretty fascinating episode yeah. rooted in science. So I'd recommend checking that out as well. But again, this so this story does come from Wyoming, and it comes from a Wyoming game and fish biologist by the name of John, boy, I wish I knew how to pronounce his last name. Mayanzinski. Mayanzinski. That looks pretty like it should be right. Like that is probably close. I think it is right. John's good with pronunciation. Okay. And it's important to note that uh, for many Wyomingites, Bigfoot's existence is old news as sightings have been reported throughout the region for decades. Damn right. But this is a really good, really interesting sighting from somewhat of a authority in the, in the area. That's right. At least when it comes to the biology and the biome of the park. The most famous of all the Wyoming Bigfoot stories was the account of Wyoming game and fish biologist, John Mianzinski, who spent almost two hours on a bright moonlit night in the Wind River Range in 1972, in a standoff with what could only be described as a Bigfoot. Quote, Around midnight, I heard something outside. It was kind of a rumbling sound, like somebody snoring. And I saw a shadow come by. Mianzinski said the nearly full moon was bright, and the silhouette cast by the moonlight made him think a bear was nosing around at a bacon grease stain on his tent. So he smacked the beast through the canvas wall. Ballsy. I took my right hand and just whacked it with the back of my hand and yelled real loud right then, and that scared it. But the creature didn't move too far away, actually returning to the sidewall of his tent two more times. When Mianzinski reached out a third time, he realized this was no bear. This time when it came back, the silhouette was different. It was standing upright. I hit it with my hand, and the instant I did that, I saw the silhouette of an arm come down on top of my tent, which was about six foot four height. The arm was long, covered with hair, and there was a humanoid hand at the end of the arm. The silhouette of the hand on the top of my tent, and I say that rather than a bear paw, because digits point straight ahead on a bear paw, and this had obvious fingers, four fingers and a thumb that was opposed. The beast pushed down hard on the top of Mianzinski's tent, collapsing it on top of him. Mianzinski said that must have startled the creature, which he still, in his confusion, thought must be some sort of bear. Mianzinski clambered out of his collapsed tent and sat near the fire, holding his firearm, knowing the beast was still nearby. I started dozing off, and I woke up to the sound of something hitting the ground. Several more similar sounds followed, and Mianzinski realized that something was throwing pine cones. A pine cone seemed to fall out of the tree, and it landed next to the fire, and then another pine cone, and then another pine cone, and I realized there was no wind blowing. These cones were not falling out of the tree. They were being lobbed at me from behind this little pine tree, and that went on for about 40 to 45 minutes. So that was the extent of that experience. It threw pine cones for 45 minutes, and then it left. Well, that reminds me of Seth Breedlove's story in, uh, was it the, o- where was he at? Oh, oh we yeah. interviewed him about um, Area X in Oklahoma. Oklahoma. Yeah. Oklahoma? Uh-huh. And he said, wasn't something throwing stuff throwing at Throwing rocks. It? Yeah. That's a common, yeah. Right. It is a common Bigfoot kind of characteristic, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that's that's a good point too. If it was a bear, bears don't have, you know. Opposable thumb. Opposable thumb. Right. Can't grasp in that way and throw things as far as I know. There's always the escaped circus monkey. For, certainly not for 45 yeah. minutes. Yeah, yeah. You know, like picking up pine cones. Oh, right, exactly. I mean, I could see it, you know, like throwing one from the ground, maybe. <laughs> like do a little, like... Like, yeah. a, like scoop it? A, a chip in golf, is that yeah. what it's called? You chip it up? Chip what shot. do you think Bigfoot... <laughs> the only reason, the only thing I can imagine is like Bigfoot's there with another Bigfoot, and they're just like laughing. 
like just throwing it and watching this guy's reaction. Because for 45 minutes, you think you get bored after a few. But if you're like, you know, with a buddy, like check this out. That's a good point. <laughs> just having some beers. Yeah. It's a Bigfoot beer. Bigfoot birch brew. Yeah, weird. Scook them. So this guy was a biologist? Yeah, similar. Actually, Chris, you want to go on here. Um, the local agencies end up weighing in on this. Okay. When he reported the incident to the district ranger for the Shoshone National Forest upon his return, Mayanzinski was told that he was not alone. The Forest Service had received numerous reports that summer of 1972 of strange sightings and occurrences in that section of the forest, similar to his experience. In recent years, though, wildlife agencies like Wyoming Game and Fish are unaware of any sightings of hairy humanoid giants. Quote, I've never heard of such a thing, said Corey Class, wildlife supervisor for the Cody Game and Fish Office. But that being said, I don't know. I can only answer based on my time and experience. Yeah, so interesting that there were other reports that summer of 1972. The same activity. In the same area to the Game and Fish. <laughs> It'd be freaky. You have this giant hand coming down on your tent as you're lying in there. Oh, how terrifying, man. You're whacking on the nose. So freaky. I would be terrified to hit a bear like yeah. that. Yeah. Let alone he a, must be pretty adept at being out there. Yeah, what sure question is, how, do you, a lot of time out how there. do you know the arm was hairy? I guess maybe you can see that in silhouette. I'm oh, sure, yeah. yeah. Especially if it's close. <laughs> you see the Bigfoot just getting pissed off and just finally going, no. Smush. <laughs> Smushing the tent. Smash you. <laughs> so the other accounts reported to the Department of Game and Fish Wildlife at that time, apparently they were seeking, people were coming there because they wanted to hunt this thing down. There were enough reports that people were getting riled up. But eventually, as the reports slowed, they ended up dropping the investigation. Allegedly. Or did it carry on? Mm. Behind the scenes, once they discovered the truth. So this guy, Mayanzinski, he was a respected game of fish biologist. Did he get, he get crap for this? Yes. He, he kept it secret, his interest in this, for a couple of decades, apparently. But he would still collect evidence, because obviously this experience has been haunting him. I'm sure. Once you see something like that... Oh, dude, and interact. You can't forget like, that's, something like that's that. Why you that's why you have trauma right there, yeah. that close of an encounter. It's why you have so many people who like go hard into Bigfoot research, mm -hmm. like just spend all their free time in the woods because they had one encounter. Yeah. And then you're like, I got to prove this because I know I'm not crazy and no one believes me. Right. You know? Yeah. I mean, just it becomes an obsession. Yeah. yeah. That's the real curse of Bigfoot. That's why when I'm researching and I'm just going through the same stories I've seen and I'm just trying to find new nuggets, I want, I want an experience like that. Even though I know I regret it, you got to leave your chair. I think a Bigfoot would be less scary than a dog Until man, it's yeah. pushing down on your tent. Yeah, that'd be pretty terrifying. He did. Did he seem terrified, though? I mean, yeah, he was freaked out. He jumped out and held his rifle all night. That's true. That'd be pretty freaky. Even if you think it's a bear. Yeah. He's like, yeah! Like smacking a bear. <laughs> yeah. Dude, that'd be terrifying. <laughs> I guess if you have a shot... Did he say he had a shotgun? A rifle, I a think. Rifle. I mean, I guess if you have a rifle in your tent, there's definitely part of you that... You know, yeah, you feel some level of security. Like you know, if this thing comes out, you're going to be blasting. Yeah, even though like a grizz, if it's a grizzly, obviously you can still destroy no, you. No, no offense to this guy, but That's if you're true. if you're a biologist, a nature biologist, and you're in the woods in a tent, would you leave bacon grease? Like you're comfortable sleeping in there? If it's bear country, bacon grease on the side of the tent? Oh, that what he said? I think I would be worried about that. Maybe he didn't realize it was there. Maybe later he realized and was like, ooh, yeah, that's like. <sighs> I mean, it's like chum in the water. It's a very strong scent. Yeah. I mean, I, you might find me coming up to a tent. Well, I had respect for you, Mayanzinski. I'm going to say that it was a, <laughs> he overlooked that. Yeah, I would know, imagine. Accident. I'm sure he didn't do it. Yeah. I'm sure he knows better than that. Yeah. Yeah. We can't talk for you here, Mr. Mayanzinski. Um, so he did during this time, even though he was trying to keep it quiet, he took a hair and skin sample to the agency's lab in Laramie. Where do you get that from? For analysis. I don't know. Apparently tent? either someone had reported it at some point. He was, you know, looking into this oh, yeah. through the years. And at that point, Superior yelled at him, threatening to have him fired, and said that he would have him fired if his name was ever publicly associated with, quote, this Bigfoot thing. So obviously- People get so mad. People get, yeah, they get real touchy. Somebody, yeah, so, so weird. weird, especially in today's day and age where it's become sort of a mainstream idea, mm -hmm. at least the concept of it being possible, or just is an entertainment right. thing. And it's weird to have a superior in fashion I guess game it going. goes back to, you know, it's, it's just anything that threatens your worldview, mm -hmm. you know, everything you believe. Yeah. People get mad about that. That's true. Especially if your career's staked upon it. Stuck. Yeah, also, if you feel like you know a certain way things are in the world. Yeah, it's, you it, have to reevaluate yeah, everything. You, if you, anytime you feel off kilter or something, you provide a new information that makes you feel uncomfortable, you have a nat natural defense. Yeah. That natural Unless response. you're used to, I mean, yeah, that's the way it is for everybody, but some people like us, 
<laughs> like we're perfect. At no, it. we're not. But we tend to be always open to these things. Yeah. Open to things like changing our perspective on things. Right. Our careers are not based on it either. In fact, they're amplified. Right. They're amplified by it. <laughs> and the skeptics out there who listen and say, well, you wouldn't believe in the skeptical side. We do that too. We also, you know, I think we do. Oh yeah. Right? Yeah. I mean, uh, not believe, but be open. That is an interesting point. Open to it. Yeah. I mean, like the official story. I think a lot of no, times, I mean, there's definitely a lot of the times that is true. Like yeah. that there's a rational explanation right. for it. There's just, as far as everything fitting into that rational, right. Exactly material. what we've been told the material world. Like I, there's just way too many experiences. Yeah, as like an and overall viewpoint. Like there's no ghosts, there's no Bigfoot, right. there's no anything other than just this material world. Mm -hmm. There's no extrasensory perception, yeah, no, no communication. No paranormal, no, no soul. Supernatural that, phenomena. That I can say I firmly do not buy. Yeah. yeah. I've had enough personal, even with things like synchronicity. Yeah. There's just too many weird things stacks, stacking up to yeah. just perfectly fit into this worldview of just, it's just the physical. Right. And we've all had our own experiences with, different sorts of phenomena. And when there are those little nodes of truth, right? There's things that poke out that say, hey, look at me. I'm oh, strange. Hello. I'm, I don't quite fit. Of course you could say, why look into it when, you know, the most Occam's razor, whatever however you want to say, the easiest explanation, the most likely, it's highly unlikely that it's this. It just go, go to the obvious. Sure, you can do that. But when there's a chance of something different and there's some evidence for it, something mysterious, unidentified, I think that's what deserve. That's what we want to do. That's the we want to put attention on that because we feel like that deserves attention. Why not talk about the thing that doesn't fit, the anomaly residue? I think that's what makes life interesting to find that those kinds of things and, and amplify the conversation around them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we can find the greater, fuller reality. Speaking of which, we have one final tale, and this is probably the most incredible one of of the evening. So this again comes from Artie Six Killer Clark's book, Encounters with Star People: Untold Stories of American Indians. Again, fascinating episode we did. We'll have linked here in the show notes. Check that out for a full episode on these stories from Artie's work. So this particular story we have not covered before. And we're doing this, of course, because it takes place in Yellowstone. More strangeness. So Bill lived in Idaho. He lived directly across from the Wyoming border. Uh, and he's a quiet guy, not known for attracting attention. And Artie meets him and briefly explains the research that she's doing. It explains to him that anything he says, because he's obviously worried about this being public, says anything that he says will be kept in strictest confidence and she'll use, you know, pseudonyms and, and the like. Uh, but this is his incredible account. The incident occurred on a hunting trip a couple of years back. I went with my cousins, Mark Three Elk and Charlie Blue. We took our horses up into the Tagwati Mountains high above Jackson Hole and set up camp. We planned to stay for a week or until all three of us bagged an elk. We got up early the first morning. We walked to an area known as Lyman Ridge. We separated there. We established a designated rendezvous point where we would meet before we returned to camp for the evening. I was the first to get back to the rendezvous point. By that time, the day was almost gone. I waited for about 15 minutes and was becoming concerned that my cousins had not returned. Darkness was closing in fast. Just as I thought I should go look for them, I saw it. The craft came in low over the tree line and descended into the valley below the ridge where I was standing. My first reaction was that my eyes were playing tricks on me. I walked along the ridge cautiously, trying to see where the craft had gone. Within a few moments, my cousin arrived. All it took was one look. I knew they had seen the craft too. I suggested that instead of returning to camp, that we walk along the ridge until we reached a cliff that overlooked the valley. If we did not locate the craft by that time, we would have no choice but to return to camp. Just as we neared the edge of the ridge, we saw it. It was circular, big. It had lights that pulsated at the bottom of the craft. It was an amazing sight. But there were hundreds of lights all over the craft. From a distance, it looked like a small city, an unbelievable, beautiful sight. We were above it on the ridge. If we had descended, it would have been no more than 100 feet, maybe closer. We watched the craft for at least 30 or 40 minutes, but we saw no star people. I remember we laid down on our stomachs and looked through our rifle scopes to get a better view. The scene below was lit up like Broadway from the lights of the craft. It was easy to see. Then we saw something 
that if I lived a thousand years, I will never forget. As we stood to take one last look at the craft, we saw a buffalo carcass being tossed out of the craft. There are tribes in Wyoming and Idaho with buffalo herds, and then there are the wild buffalo in Yellowstone. Seeing a buffalo is not unusual here, but to see one tossed out of a spacecraft like a stale loaf of bread was not something anyone could expect. Immediately, we fell flat on our stomachs and took up our positions again. We watched through our rifle scopes with our fingers on the triggers, but soon the lights began to rotate and the craft rose into the sky. Within seconds, it was gone, just disappeared. By now, we are in total darkness. We walked back to camp in silence. After breakfast, we hiked around the ridge until we came upon the dead buffalo. We were shocked beyond words. The poor animal had been mutilated. It was a pregnant female, and her baby had been killed in the womb. Only its eyes and genitals were missing. The mother buffalo had empty eye sockets. Her ears, tail, and eyes were missing. Her stomach had been cut open, and the placenta holding the baby was missing. We sat there confused. We knew we should report it, but we feared the game officers would arrest us. We were the ones with the buffalo carcass, not the star people. The word would get out that we were some kind of psychos and people would talk about us for want of something better to do. We decided to cover it all up and stay quiet, and we have. I only told my brother, John, who agreed we did the best thing by staying quiet. Charlie and Mark are sworn to secrecy. They will never breathe a word. So now you know and you can see why my secrecy is so important. It is frustrating. We did nothing wrong, but to try to explain that aliens were involved would just be too much for anyone to believe. We would probably have ended up with jail time and a heavy fine. None of us could afford that. I have my girls to support. I can't lose my job. The old timers used to talk about the star people. Sometimes the star people would come into the sweat lodges or our elders traveled the stars and visited the star people. When they returned, they told us wondrous tales of our ancestors. As a boy, I never understood it. As a man, I grew up to believe that it was true. I was in the sweat lodge when miraculous things would happen because of the star people. Now when I close my eyes and see the carcass of the mother buffalo and her calf, I know they are not the helpers, the ancestors. These are a different group of star people, and maybe we should be worried about them. Yeah, creepy. Eerie tale. Yeah. Well, there's your answer if you choose to believe it about the uh, cattle mutilation problem. Yeah. It just yeah, popped I mean, up again. Right. It's kind of what I think most people assume. Yeah, I mean, there's always the theories about satanic cults and I don't, yeah. crazy, or even the government for testing purposes of some kind. Who knows that that wasn't the government? A oh, blind project. That's Although they true. probably wouldn't need a Starcraft to go down and get, get a cow. It. Why not use one if you got that's one? That's true. You know? I mean, what <laughs> else? You could just buy do? a cow. Yeah, I guess they probably don't need to steal a cow from. They could just go through the park system. Buffalo. Unless it's like a psychological attack. Who knows? I, I do think the government has those potential certain craft that they well, don't, yeah, we you, don't know about. If you believe Bob Lazar's accounts right. uh, of that advanced technology, wherever it came from, and the back engineering of it, could they be using that to zip around or the Or the story our listeners sent in about, remember John Kerry on that black triangle oh, yeah. in the Antarctica? Uh -huh. Oh yeah. His alleged experience there. But yeah, yeah, the recent accounts, actually Greg Benedicto, one of our listeners and community members joined the Facebook community, posted an article about this a few days ago. What's up, Greg? I hadn't heard, heard about it yet at the time. Now it'll be like a, two weeks ago by the time this comes out, but Six cattle found dead in three Texas counties, all with their tongues missing. And this happened over the course of like a night or two or something. Mm -hmm. Why are they so interested in, I mean, haven't they gleaned all they can glean from <laughs> cattle at this point? Maybe it's a tradition. Maybe they're a slow learning breed. It could be some kind of like, oh yeah, like maybe it's like a time ritual? span ritual. An ET ritual. Uh, I have a feeling it's more biological. Maybe they just need biological things that are alive, like samples that are, uh -huh. that are still alive yeah I mean, it has to be grown in its natural environment yeah. for i think some it's reason. inner earth civilization's version of cow tipping like they you know funny inner earth high schoolers i can now hear the people that don't think we're funny to come up turning <laughs> off the show no but hear me out hear me out they say instead of tipping calves over they abduct them yeah we get it yeah and, but in we like got a it. spacecraft not funny <laughs> do the drum thing 
<laughs> go get your blueberry. <laughs> hey, I I tell, tell a lot of, I tell a lot of good okay, jokes. It's okay. Cecily thinks that it's okay to have teddy bears above thirty years old. That's true. It's fine. I don't. I have him. I'm not holding him. You sleep with him. <laughs> don't. <laughs> I was going to say real quick, I just think it's cool that they're forming a task force to finally do like a, a nationwide communication of law enforcement, bureau land management. I'm pretty sure it's happening now where they're getting together and actually communicating with these accounts and with these reports from different ranchers and farmers. How to actually try to identify the phenomenon and mm-hmm. resolve the issue. Yeah. Cause this is a lot of money that the people are losing. Linda, Linda Mulhow, you know, obviously Strange Harvest, Strange Harvest. We talked about that many times, but she came up with that classic documentary, end of the seventies, early eighties, award-winning journalist. Yeah, that phenomenon has been going on for centuries. Yeah. Well, I hope you guys enjoyed this strange dive into Yellowstone and the mysteries therein. Yes, and we're not done. There's much more to go over in the expansion. In the expansion. Supernatural accounts, vampiric accounts. Are we going to die from a volcano? We're going to tell you the absolute reality of it. Then some dark stuff coming up. Oh, there's some dark stuff in there. And some, some cautionary tales about how to not die in Yellowstone because it is a uh, minefield of uh hot springs boiling water pockets yeah it's a it's a dangerous place grizzly bears this is slightly off topic but still in the volcano realm do you do you guys see that netflix documentary yeah that's when my anxiety began insane yeah i'd walk out of the room what was that called i can't even remember it's a great movie i mean basically it's a documenting of a volcano that went off was it new zealand it was new zealand you know, people were right there mm-hmm. and experienced the pyroclastic flow. And yeah. there was a group of people that went off of the island right before it happened. And so they like had to come back and and rescue the people that were left. Right. Yeah. That's an and incredible like, story. Skin is falling off. It's just like a horrific scene. I can't imagine going through something like that and surviving. Yeah. Really good documentary, but also very like sad and just intense. Yeah. It's definitely, I enjoyed it for the, the cautionary stories that were told and all, but also like the amazing things that people did in rescuing. Mm-hmm. It was very much a story. Standing up and that, yeah. yeah. That's what I took away from it. That's why I watched it all when Chris couldn't because he was scared. I watched a lot of it. <laughs> anyway, it was great. definitely an anxiety yeah. producing film. I wasn't, I didn't think the volcano was going to erupt through the television. Right. But it was just, <laughs> yeah, anxiety driving. Well, we'll put a link in the show notes for you guys if, if you want to check that out. It is, it's intense, but it's good. I'm a courageous man in case any of our listeners Chris want to. Chris is a <laughs> courageous man. <laughs> Forgot about that. And speaking of not dying, the people we would like to die the least oh, yes. are our members. And we have some special thank yous today. Yeah, we have some very special people to thank. Sign up if you want us to not want you to die the least. Excuse me? Or you just want episodes. Or you just want episodes. You want incredible content, double the episodes. Yes, but those that sign up at a specific tier get their name read on the show, at least for, for now. 200 extra hours of content, mm-hmm. of fully produced, amazing research, and wonderful stories to fill your ear holes and mind brain. Absolutely. And the mind brain. <laughs> All right. And those people are. Thank you, too. Starting off with a dog man, Whisper Crystal Soggy Bottom Soaps. Crystal of Ooh. Soggy Bottom Soaps. Sounds warm and inviting. Refreshing. Thank you, Crystal, for the sweetness. Welcome to the whole Brant. Yay! Brant. Just Brant. Welcome in. Plain and simple. Sounds English. Good to have you yes. here, Brant. Uh, come on down to the whole Alexa Raider. Raid the hole. Everyone hide your goods <laughs> and valuables. <laughs> yes. Because <laughs> she's raiding. Gorgon Mike is here. Yes. Ooh. Gorgon rhymes with Oregon. Turning you to stone with his snaky hair. Don't leave your kids home alone. <laughs> yes. <laughs> with his snaky hair. Janine Thompson is here. Hi, Janine, All for right. an extra $30. What a generous hey, sweetheart. That's our mom's Janine, name. You have our, Janine, you have our mom's name. What a beautiful name. And you apparently have. our mom's heart. Aww. Aww. Exactly. That's generous. Welcome to the hole. We love you, Janine. Yes. Ellie Burnett. Ellie. Come on down. Yes, yeah. Ellie with a little belly. That's weird. <laughs> she sounds amazing. I know. It's very weird. I, mean, I meant like she's really skin. I don't know. You're just saying rhyming things. I, yeah, I'm just rhyming. But I'm having fun with it. Man Batman is here. Man Batman. Man, man Batman. Batman. <laughs> he's not only a man, a bat, but he's also a dogman whisperer. Oh, oh, wow. It's got a lot going on. What a paradox of amazingness. A chimera. You're a super sir. Yes, you are. Another dogman whisperer nipping at his heels what? is Kelly M. Nelson. Welcome to be here, Kelly. Happy to have you here with us. Kelly, that's always my favorite name. Welcome to be here, Kel. We love you. Gosh, the generosity today. Scott Bunn is a shadow person of interest going above and beyond. What? Toast him up. 
and call them tasty. Yes. Welcome in, scotches. <laughs> that's right. That's what we do. Yum. Mitch Cable is here. Another Dogman Whisperer. Ooh. Alan at the door. Mitch Cable. Hold the line. Welcome, sir. Madison Kelly. Welcome to be here. Madison Kelly. There's, we yes. have Kelly the first name. little belly. <laughs> Another belly. John is obsessed with bellies. Yeah. <laughs> Weirdo. Uh. <laughs> Weirdo. Yep. <laughs> Trenton Sheridan is here. I think he actually uh, produced some of the uh, Yellowstone episode uh, shows. Really? Is that the guy, same guy? Sheridan? It's probably him. Probably him. Sheridan? He knew we were going to do Thank it. Thank you, Trenton. I'm, sh- I'm sure that's the same Sheridan. Much love. Uh, but welcome to be here. We love you. Pat Jorda. Hello, my friend. Pat Jorda. Welcome yes. into the hole. Pat Jorda. Yes. That's a cool name. That sounds like an actor. That's right. Throw your wish, throw your coins down into the wishing well, because it will be, I don't know where I'm going with this. Ethan Wells is here. All right. <laughs> I was thinking like creepy well, like girl with long hair over her face crawling out of it sort of well. No, it's just Ethan Wells, because he's very well. Welcome in. Sounds like another actor. We have a bunch of actors. Kiefer. Kiefer, Kiefer is a dogman whisperer. Now that's an actor. Come on. Is it Kiefer Sutherland? Give an old bleef whole howl to Kiefer. Yeah. Oh. Yes. Very patriotic. Oh. Thank you, buddy. Celia Bros- Brossard. Or Brossard. See you later. Is here. See you. Just, and everything ends. Welcome in, Celia. Welcome to be here. Yes. Yes. Billy Guthrie is a dogman whisperer. Come on in, Billy. Yeah, Billy Goat Guthrie in the hole. Come on in, Billy. Show us those fangs. The water's warm, Bill. <laughs> Guys, we had a whole pack of Dogman here, so I'm just gonna read them right in a row here. Yes, Dogman pack, go. Extra special love to Amber Johnson, Dogman Whisperer, Froylin Ramirez, heck yes, Froylin, and Eric Crowley. Run with the pack, children of the moon, as a pack of Dogman Whisperers together into the hole. Thank you guys so much. Um, Geniuses. Gosh, I can't thank enough the people that really do go above and beyond. These next two are both shadow people of interest. We have, man, I hope I say this right, De Priest Anderson. Mm. That's a fascinating name. De Priest Anderson. Blessing us with his generosity. Welcome to the whole De Priest. As yes. a priest would. Yes! Uh, yes, with yes. His shadow for some interest. And of course, Damien Douglas. Right. Damien! With the alliteration. Killing yes. it in here in the yes. hole. All for you, Damien. It is. And all for us, apparently. We could not do it without you guys. Yeah. That is 100% a fact. And two more, two more little, uh, two more black-eyed cool kids splashing into the hole here is the Reeses. The so Reeses. It must be a family. Maybe it's a pack. All right. A whole family the, of Reeses. The Reeses and all their pieces, sweet like candy. Oh well, the Reeses. This is a special shout out to you and your family. Thank you for listening. Yes. We hope we live up to your expectations. And finally, the final, <laughs> yes, okay. <laughs> and the, the final uh, member to be thanked today is Kenzie Johnson. Yes! All right, Kenzie. Kenzie! Thank you to be here, my friend. Kenzie Johnson, welcome in. I used to know a Kenzie. Yeah, it's a good name. Uh, thank you, guys. Thank you so much. Uh, you guys really you keep us going, and uh, this is all for you. Yeah. Thank you so much for being extra generous, supporting us, and not, jo- not only being a member, but signing up for a little extra support and a shout out really is a huge help and you're awesome. Yes! Special shout out to Lindsay Mabes for extra special specialness helping us with some back end stuff in the show this week. Really appreciate it. Oh yeah. Thank you, Lindsay. You are a treasure of the whole. Yes, 100%. Treasure. Little bling. Bing! Lindsay! All right, and the rest of you guys, I'm sure we'll see you in the expansion for some more Yellowstone strangeness. Get excited. As we are. That's right. And if you haven't heard your name yet, it's coming up. Yep. All right, guys. We'll see you next time on, on Believable. Get it. Believable.